Good evening, uh, comrades. Welcome to uh, the latest uh, LLA education session on Marxism and its uh, contemporary relevance. Um, tonight, we're uh, lucky to have uh, Chris Cassells, who's going to talk to us about aspects of uh, Marxist philosophy. I'm sure that uh, quite a lot of comrades who may well have uh, read Marx over the years, particularly uh, the, the earlier writings, will have um, often struggled with some of the philosophical language. And indeed, if, um, if you've delved into Marx's philosophical work, many, um, many, many comrades have always found that, you know, let's to use the diplomatic term challenging. Um, and I think, I think there are two, two problems that many, many comrades in the English speaking world perhaps encounter. First of all, that, um, that the translations are often uh, not always of the best, or at least um, in being translated from German into English, um, there are often difficulties and debates about the meanings of the words. But perhaps more importantly, I think that uh, in the English speaking world, and I perhaps only speak for myself in this, that our training in philosophy has, uh, has actually been quite woefully deficient, so that uh, that empirical tradition that Marx often writes about, Engels in particular, uh, does the same. Um, I think we still <laughs> suffer from it. Um, why understanding Marx's views on philosophy, I think, is important, and I'm sure Chris will talk about this, is, of course, that when he's talking about politics, and indeed, even when he's writing fairly contemporary political work, he's often basing um, those, uh, those ideas on his particular philosophical concepts. And so that often ideas of contradiction, ideas of dialectics, uh, ideas of resolution, Aufheben, transcendence, uh, abolition, all of those ideas are implicit in that world, word, often come into um, aspects of his political pamphlets. A pamphlet like the Communist Manifesto, for example, which many people have read, is I think really quite saturated with Marx's philosophical ideas. So uh, I'm really looking forward to tonight's session and Chris is going to talk about materialist dialectics and um, it's going to talk about, I think, the importance of Marx's philosophy, some of the key elements of it. Um, we'll, we'll have the usual pattern, which is uh, an introduction by Chris, say for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll um, switch over to questions and I'll probably take a group of questions or contributions from comrades and then I'll um, uh, ask Chris to uh, respond and then to, uh, to sum up at the end. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Chris, um, ma ma <laughs> materialist dialectics. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, thanks for coming to this evening's um, session. I hope it will be um, useful and interesting for everyone and we can have a productive discussion um, on what is to me a particularly uh, important topic. So yes, tonight we're we're going to be talking about um, Marxist dialectic. Now, obviously, this is a it's a notoriously difficult subject. But what I'd like to do is provide a kind of broad introduction to the topic that will hopefully serve as a kind of launch pad um, for discussion afterwards. Um, this it's difficult to know how to pitch a, a short introduction like this. Um, on the one hand, I'm going to try and cover as as much ground as possible. Um, but I know that some of you may be well versed in all of this, while while others may be coming to it with less familiarity. So. I'll try to work through the basics in my introduction and then we can hopefully um, go into a little more depth um, through the discussion that follows um, and through contributions from others. I'll also try not to go wildly over, over the 30 minutes, so please stop me if I, if I do. Um, so I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about some of the challenges in pinning down the dialectic, particularly within Marx's own writings. Um, I'll then start to flesh out what we actually mean by the dialectic and how it compares with, with formal logic. Um, saying a little bit about its historical development, particularly by Hegel, um, before looking at Marx's own dialectic in, in more detail and how he uses it in his work and how we can continue to apply it today. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll, I'll give a brief overview of some of the various positions um, taken on the dialectic and, and some of the ongoing debates. <clears throat> so the big challenge when, when confronting Marx's dialectic is, of course, that Marx himself says very little about it, um, at least not explicitly. Um, the afterword to the second German edition of Capsule provides probably the most direct treatment of the concept in Marx's work, 
in it he writes about his um, dialectic method not only being uh, different from Hegel's but but the opposite and how with Hegel the dialectic stands on its head and it must be turned right side up again to discover the rational kernel within the mystical shell. In various letters to Dietzgen and, and Engels, Marx refers to a desire to produce something in the dialectic itself, um, some sort of work or, or, or treatise, um, but sadly for us, this wasn't to be. So there's little to go on in terms of any kind of explanation within Marx's work as to what exactly the dialectic is and how exactly it differ, differs from Hegel's. However, obviously we're not left completely in the dark. There are a number of, of avenues of, of exploration. Um, firstly, while Marx's work contains little in the way of explicit, explanation of the dialectic, because work is infused with the dialectical method and a product of, of a dialectical mode of, of thinking, um, the Grundrys and, and Capital Volume 1 in particular. Secondly, there is Hegel's work itself, if, if we can break through the, the mystification. Um, and of course, there's the body of work beginning with, with Engels, um, which has developed a dialectic subsequently. Now, of course, that's not everyone's view, and there, there are those that seek to, to, to split Marx and Engels up um, in this respect. Um, and I provide in, in, in the interest of, of balance and also because it otherwise provides a, a reasonably accessible overview of some of the, the main concepts, an article in the suggested um, reading whose his author is of that view. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that debate towards the end. However, for, for the purposes of this introduction, we'll, we'll take Marx and Engels generally to be um, in agreement. So what is Marx's dialectic? First of all, as I've, as I've already suggested, it's, it's a method or a methodology. Um, in this sense, it's a, it's a means of understanding and investigating the world, and that's its function. If there are, if there are two fundamental aspects to Marxism, like a, sort of a method and a practice, then dialectics provides the method, while the class struggle um, constitutes the practice. Obviously, there's a relation between the two, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, secondly, dialectics is, is something that, that exists in the world. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on. Um, the dialectic um, consists of a number of laws, um, again, which I'll, I'll, I'll go through in greater detail later, um, and is generally um, counterposed or, or contrasted with, with formal logic. Um, so the difference between the two can be some by saying that one formal logic is, is, is concerned with a simplified state, um, a simplified kind of static world of substance where things either are or, or are not, uh, while the other dialectics is concerned with the world of process and relation, um, one that is in constant motion, undergoing constant change. Um, and so as such, Trotsky describes the dialectic as being, being the logic of evolution. So at the heart of the difference between these two methods of understanding reality is, is the question of, of contradiction. Um, so I'm going to go into this in a little more detail, so hopefully it'll help bring a bit of clarity to the, the various concepts under, under discussion. Um, and uh, as anyone who's had the, uh, the misfortune of taking an introductory philosophy course at a British, British university at any point will likely know there are, there are three basic laws of logic, um, that is of, of classical or formal logic, also known as, as common sense logic or, or in the Marxist literature, uh, vulgar logic. So these are um, the principle of identity, the principle of non-contradiction, and the principle of the excluded middle. The principle of identity is simply A equals A. In other words, everything is what it is. Um, Leibniz extends his law of the identity, um, this, this law to the, the um, uh, identity of indiscernibles, um, which is to say that any two things which have the exact same properties are in fact identical, that is the same thing, which is slightly more sophisticated than simply A equals A as it begins to posit a relation between identity and difference. But the point is that, that these are these are basic fundamental laws that are supposed to, to govern thought. Um, a equals A expresses an, an affirmative truth that says something about something, and as such is, is given um, primacy by, by Leibniz. The second principle, um, the principle of non-contradiction, can be expressed in a, in a few different ways, um, the distinction, distinction between which is, is, is of some significance. So the traditional formulation is to say that A is B and a is not B are two mutually exclusive statements. So for example, um, spot is a dog and spot is not a dog. These two things cannot both be true. However, with Leibniz again, this is expressed slightly differently um, as A is not not A. So again, for example, a dog is not not a dog. This is a statement that, that cannot be true. Um, the difference here is, is that the formulation A is not not A um, presupposes that A 
is E, hence why Leibniz grants the law of identity primacy. Now, this isn't hugely relevant to our discussion, but it, but it is um, significant in that it's Leibniz who established this relation uh, and opposition between identity and difference, which is really crucial to Hegel's development of the dialectic. The third principle, the law of the excluded middle, um, is simply the principle that either a proposition or its negation is true, so either A or not A. This basically represents an extension of the, of the principle of non-contradiction and comes down to saying every judgment is either, is either true or false. So these are the basic laws of, of formal logic. Um, and as far as they go in a certain level, they, they have a use. The problems occur when, when these laws are applied to, to living, moving reality. So formal logic has a, has a problem with contradiction. Now, according to formal logic, contradiction in the world is an impossibility, while any contradiction in our thinking or in our arguments is, is symptomatic of, a, of an error or a mistake. So it basically says, you know, things are what they are, they aren't what they are, and every proposition is either true or false, it can't be both. Um, hence why it's known as, as the kind of logic of common sense or as a, as a vulgar logic. It's logic of a, of a simplified static world, but one that is, is inadequate to a world that is in a constant state of, of change and motion um, as the one that we live in is. However, there's obviously a relation between formal logic and, and dialectical logic. The latter doesn't eliminate the former. So Trotsky characterizes this relation as being like the relation between the still photograph and, and film. So still, still photographs are not abolished by film, rather film combines a series of stills according to the laws of motion. Similarly, still photography freezes a moment in time, like the simplified static categories of, of formal logic, whereas film captures a world dynamic in, in motion. And in the same way that film combines still images, dialectics includes, but, but moves beyond um, formal logic. So I'll, I'll say more on kind of explicitly on contradiction in a, in a minute, but for now I want to keep looking at the distinction between formal and, and dialectical logic as a means of drawing out some of the, the kind of key concepts. So I've spoken about the, the poverty of, of formal logic in terms of grasping a world that's in motion. I think it's worth expanding on, on that a little bit. So according to, to a common sense logic, the world consists of, of individual things. Each thing has a history and it's externally connected with other things. They bump into each other, and move each other and so on. In dialectical logic, rather than being interested in things, we're interested in process and in relation. Um, it's worth bearing in mind, of course, that the system we're talking about here, Marx's dialectic is a materialist, materialist one. Um, so, so this, this emphasis on process, process and, and relation doesn't deny or, or change material, material reality in any way. Rather, it's, it's the means of understanding reality, what we take as, as our, our basic units. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a question of abstraction. Um, it's where we draw the conceptual distinctions that tell us where one thing ends and the next one begins in, in both time and, and, um, and space. So capital, for instance, is understood by Marx in, in, in both of these ways. So as a process, it includes primitive accumulation, accumulation and, and the concentration of capital. It's, it's history is, is a part of what capital is, but it is also its relations. It's the relations between labor, commodities, value, capitalist workers, and so on. It's constituted by these relations, it's, it's made up of them. And so we make these relations the object of our, our inquiry. Now, this is a significant, mental shift in terms of how we understand the world, focusing not on the things themselves, which is, is, a, is a futile task, really, is it, it's impossible to pin anything down in the world um, because the world is undergoing you know, constant change, but rather um, it's the processes and, and it's the relations. Um, so as I'm just about to go on to discuss, when we talk about contradiction, for example, bear in mind that primarily we're thinking in terms of, re of relation and, and process and, and not of, of things in and not themselves. So I suppose the question now is, <clears throat> what is what is a contradiction? Um, and this is where we can start to flesh out the dialectic, and it's also where, where Hegel comes in. So Hegel's view of, of the primary law of, of formal logic, that is um, the principle of identity, the, the A equals A, a, a cat is a cat or whatever, is that while it's correct, it's absurd. He describes it variously as, as boring, tedious, silly, you know, it expresses something that is self-evident, but it's an empty truth that, that, that tells you nothing. 
So rather than base a whole methodology on the principle of identity as, as classical logic does, Hegel puts contradiction at the heart of his system. So he writes, um, contradiction is the, the root of all movement and vitality. It is only insofar as something has a contradiction within it that it moves as an urge and activity. So again, this, this reinforces um, the dialectic's preoccupation with, with movement, with reality as it is embedded in, in time and space. So contradiction, that is the depositing and, and resolving of contradictions, is what provides the dialectical method with its dynamic drive. However, contradiction is, is not the same as, as, as kind of mere opposition or difference. For contradiction to occur, the opposition or difference has to take the form of what Hegel calls a negative unity. So what Hegel means here is that the contradiction is, is only a contradiction um, when within the relation that exists both a negative opposition, but also expressed within the same relation that exists a positive form of, of sameness or identity. In other words, it's through some kind of common content or, or common relation that an opposition becomes transformed into a contradiction um, or a negative unity. So this is what allows Marxists to talk about the, the contradiction of, for example, use value and exchange value. There's a unity, a commonality within these things, both existing within the commodity form. And this constitutes a polar opposition where you have two opposing poles united in opposition. Because of the dynamic nature of contradiction, these oppositions then become the, the driving motors of history. But just to be clear, the contradictions that we're talking about here aren't of the form of, you know, on the one hand this or on the other hand that, nor is it the common sense understanding of, of contradiction that contradiction takes the form of, you know, if I claim X, I can't at the same time claim not X. Um, you know, that 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 view is, is, um, is the view that contradiction um, that applies to, to ideas about things rather than to, to things themselves. Um, and as I've already kind of touched on, the, this common sense view is based on the understanding that reality is composed of, of separate independent parts. Um, so Bertel Ullman points out that the, the most non-dialectical um, disciplines are forever looking for the, the outside agitator, the thing that comes in from outside, what, whatever problem it is that's under examination. And, and it's the cause of whatever occurs. The dialectical method, on the other hand, shows that change results from internal contradiction. The problems for capitalism are the problems of capitalism. They are they're internal to the system. Of course, the other common practice in, in bourgeois thought um, is to look at various bits of the system one at a time, and as a result, completely miss the interdependence inter inter within um, the system and the interdependence between each part. Um, and the contradictory relations um, that they're embedded in. But to return to contradiction, so contradiction is it's, it's not a non sequitur, it's not two things in opposition that simply cancel each other out. What's key to Hegel's notion of a contradiction is that the relation is an exclusive one that exists within a common identity. It is this that ensures that the poles of relation are not simply indifferent or, or externally related to each other, but that their opposition is um, constitutive of the relation itself and is an active dynamic one where both poles of opposition include and exclude each other at the same time, what we refer to as the, the interpenetration of opposites. The dialectical movement occurs when this is driven to the point where the polar opposites become unfixed and fused to form a higher conceptual expression of the negative unity, producing a new category. And this is the general form of Hegel's logic, the coexistence of two contradictory sides, their conflict and their fusion into a new category, as Marx put it. So here we finally had arrived at what's, what's popularly described as, as the dialectic, the notion of, um, you know, as I'm sure you all know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, although hopefully you can already see that it's, it's, um, it's a bit more complicated than, than that. Now, the problem with, with Hegel, of course, is that he is an idealist. Um, so reality exists in the mind rather than the world. This means that his dialectic is imprisoned within what's referred to as, as the idea. Basically, this is the, it's the notion that the kind of mystically sitting above and beyond space and time exists a, a plane of pure thought within which exists a total categorical system, a system of categories which, which are the source of all change in nature and in reality. So as Engels points out, this is, by the dialectic's own principle, a, a contradiction. If the whole point is this inherent dialectic of constant and absolute change, then why, why enclosed within it is it a system which is not subject to change? 
So hopefully it's becoming clear now what, what Marx is attempting to rescue from the Hegelian mystical shell. In its materialist form, dialectics, maintain, dialectics maintains that every living thing, every systematic activity is in a constant process of movement and change, no matter how non-existent or infinitesimal that change appears to be. The source of that change and movement, the contradiction, is itself open-ended and constant rather than closeted in, in the idea. In this sense, the dialectic is not just a mode of thought, although you know it is that too, um, but it's also something that can be found in the world. So of course there's there's, there's a lot more that can be um, said about Hegel, but I think now is probably a good time to 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 um, directly take on you know, Marx's dialectic itself. And of course, to do that, we can turn to, to Engels, who, who identifies three principal laws of dialectics. Um, so I'll describe these briefly, and then and then um, we can return to Marx and, and see how they how they actually operate. So the three um, laws of, of materialist dialectics are one, the law of the transformation of quantity into quality and vice versa. The law of the interpenetration of opposites, which is the second, and three, the law of the negation of the negation. So the first law, transformation of, of quantity into quality, is simply the principle that qualitative change, that is when something changes from one thing into another, occurs only through quantitative change. So what we're talking about here is, is process. So initially, um, movement within any process takes a, a, a quantitative form. Um, that is one or more of its aspects. Um, each process also being a relation composed of aspects increases or decreases in size or number. And eventually at a certain point, and that, that point varies depending on the process, a change in quality takes place. So in other words, it becomes something else despite its main constitutive relations remaining the same. So a good example from Marx is, is the transformation of money into capital. It's only when money reaches a certain amount um, an amount sufficient to buy labour power and produce value, does money become capital? So here we have a change in quantity that results in a change in quality. And similarly, that can work on the opposite the principle where, where a reduction in, in, in amount can result in capital changing in, back into money. So the second law we've already touched on, um, again, to put it simply, um, so this is the law of the interpenetration of opposites. Um, it's the notion that, that it is, it is the, the, these bipolar oppositional relations which drive change. Um, the fact that, that within each relation, um, it both includes and excludes its, its opposite. Now in practice, what this allows Marx to do is to recognize that nothing, so no event, uh, no party, person, process, whatever, um, is simply what it appears to be at any particular moment, that these things are situated within a, a broader, um, Kind of vastly complex web of, of relations and conditions producing oppositions and contradictions um, and ultimately change. Finally, the third law, which we've already um, also kind of touched on, although not explicitly, is, is the law of the negation of the negation. So for Engels, this is, the, this is the primary law of dialectics. It's the process by which synthesis is produced, where the negation itself um, is negated um, and the contradiction resolved. Um, so as a bit of an aside here, kind of in relation to, to Engels' view that this third law is the primary law of dialectics, um, the question of which law is, is, is primary has, has occupied um, various people. So for Trotsky, it's the conversion of quantity into quality that is the key to the process of change, while for, for Lenin, it's the interpenetration of opposites. And there's some evidence that Marx shares Engels' view and sees the negation of the negation as, as the moving and generating principle. Um, this isn't necessarily a, a, the sterile debate, it, it appears, um, but it has some significance in that it does inform the way in which the dialectical method is applied, where emphasis is placed and, and what conclusions are drawn. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it particularly, um, but I think hopefully what's kind of come through in this um, brief introduction so far is, is the, the fact that these laws are, are bound by this notion of contradiction, the, 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 the nature of these laws is um, kind of they're, they're interconnected um the ultimate driving force um in the constant movement of, of positives and resolve contradictions the three laws each contain their own form of contradiction and, and in my view all are necessary to grasp um the full complexities of the of the historical um process 
Now, Engel spends a lot of time demonstrating how these laws operate in nature. Um, and as I've said, I'll, I'll kind of touch on that um, towards the end. But for now, I'm going to return to Marx and, and, and look at how these laws are applied to his principal objective study, which is, which is social labour. So as we've discussed, the primary difference between Hegel and Marx is, is the difference between an idealist and a materialist account of the dialectic. Now, this also applies to their approach to, to human history and society. So Hegel's approach is speculative. Um, the fundamental dynamic plays out for Hegel in, in philosophical thought. Um, that thought takes on successive phenomenal social forms, each stage of which is a necessary step in the unfolding of the absolute idea. That is the, the kind of logical conclusion of philosophical thought. Now, the social form that this takes, as you would expect from, from bourgeois philosopher, is, is, is the, the bourgeois state and society. Um, that's the form that Hegel considers to be the basis of, of a free society. Now, Marx's approach is, is the opposite. Rather than begin with philosophical thought, he begins with social labour. Um, the reason being that though this, this may appear kind of a banal and, and mundane in, in comparison with philosophy it is an actual fact it's the real starting point of human history it's the point where we can you know band together socially and survive the hardships of nature and, and begin to socially evolve so for marx then the, the materialist dialectic demonstrates how history evolves and develops through the dialectic of forces and relations of production um, and how this dialectic drives social labor itself to develop and evolve and this is, um, this is uh, one of Marx's kind of crowning achievements, positing the dialectical motor force of history in a materialist historical subject and, and systematic mode of activity. Um, it, it heralds kind of a new subject matter under, under scientific investigation. So how does this um, dialectic of, of, of forces and, and relations of, of production operate? Um, at which point um, can, in accordance with the laws of dialectic, systematic, qualitative change and historical transformation of the forces and relations of production occur. So, and hopefully in this you'll begin to see the kind of the, the dialectic at work. Um, so Marx sets two conditions. The first is that um, no social order ever perishes before all the productive forces for which there is room in it have developed. And the second condition is that new high relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society itself. Um, so both um, quotes from Marx. So on the first condition, that no social order ever perishes before all the productive forces for which there is room in it have developed. Um, it's worth pointing out, and, and Kevin mentioned this in his introduction, that this is not to be judged uh, on a purely empirical basis, you know, for example, by which is the which is much of the tradition, unfortunately, um, in this country. Um, for example, by looking to bits of the world where, where capitalism still has room for development. So, you know, it will always be the case that there's, there's some corner of the globe that's not fully subjected to the exploitative relations of capitalism. Um, but the point is that capitalism is and has been for some time a world system. Um, Neither is it about working out room for development in quantitative terms. For example, how many, how many more factories are required to, to, to fully, fully develop? Um, the question needs to be confronted on a, on a materialist dialectical basis. Um, it's about the, the systemic forms of posited and resolved contradiction that reflects the particular historical and social form of relation governing the productive forces. It's about the stage of development of the social system in terms of quantitative and qualitative change. It's the, the dynamic of the interpenetration of opposites and so on. It's about the social form that qualitative change takes and the, the systemic limits and barriers to change generated by the social form and the nature of, of the class relations. In other words, it's about analyzing the contradictory development of the historically specific social form. This is the development that, that paves the way to a transition to a, to a new form of society. And the second condition put forward by Marx that the new higher relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society itself is similar to the first and that it's very difficult to approach it on a, on a purely em empirical or, or quantitative basis. Again, it's not about attempting to measure the degree of, of maturation, you know, what would you even, what would you measure, what would you measure it against. Instead, we need to stress, again, the importance of the qualitative element. So what we're talking about here is really the polar opposition between two qualitative forms, between two systemic modes of productive relation. 
one being the declining state, the other being the potential um, that is lying within, within the womb of the old. So obviously quantitative and, and empirical analysis are extremely important in terms of gaining a, a fuller analytical understanding of the process, but it's the, the qualitative manner in which they are dialectically relate and evolve that is, that is crucial for an understanding of the dynamics that are, that are contained in, in the, kind of the, the systemic poles of, of the historical contradiction. And at this point, it's, it's worth saying that despite these two conditions, this, this process is it's not a mechanical one. You know, there is the matter of the class struggle. And certainly the possibilities that exist in terms of historical development are constrained by various parameters. So, you know, as we've been discussing, the outcome of the process is never mechanically predetermined. Um, Bernis Mandel calls this the parametric determinism, where men and women make their own history, albeit within a given set of possibilities. But crucially, you, you cannot have these social forms and the class relations they entail without also having class struggle. The class struggle is both a social product as well as the fundamental form, manifestation and expression, the core drive of human historical development. So it's directly predicated on the, on the objective reality of the historical dialectic of forces and relations of production. The materialist dialectic is both its subjective and objective aspects and, and, and neither can be neglected. Um, so I feel like I've, I've, um, I've covered quite a lot of ground now in a, in a fairly short amount of time, um, hopefully. Um, and hopefully this is kind of provided an overview of the, the development of the dialectic, what the materialist dialectic consists of, and a sense of how Marx has used it. So what I thought I'd do now, rather than going into any further details, to just pull back a bit and make some general remarks about the, the dialectical methods. Uh, and of course, I'll, I'll mention some of the different in, interpretations of it that continue to have you know, relevance within Marxist theory. So Trotsky famously says, and I'll, I'll quote this in full as I think it gives further credence to the, the purpose and necessity of engaging with the dialectical method. He, he says, uh, the essence of Marxism consists in this, that it approaches society concretely as a subjective for objective research, as a subject for objective research and analyzes human history as one would a colossal laboratory record. Marxism appraises ideology as a subordinate integral element of the material social structure. Marxism examines the class structure of society as a historically conditioned form of the development of the productive forces. Marxism deduces from the productive forces of society the interrelations between human society and surrounding nature, and these in turn are determined at each historical stage by man's technology, his instruments and weapons, his capacities and methods for struggle with nature. Precisely the subjective approach arms Marxism with the insuperable power of historical foresight. So in terms of what actually that might look like uh, as a method methodological process, so again, Bertel Ullmann suggests breaking it down into six successive moments. The first is an ontological one. In other words, it's the initial moment confronting the world as it really is. That is an infinite number of mutually dependent processes with no clear or fixed boundaries that they all kind of coalesce to form a, a loosely structured whole or totality. Secondly, there's the, the epistemological moment, which entails working out how to organise our thinking to understand such a world. Third is the moment of inquiry, using the categories derived from the, the previous moment to, to aid investigation. Fourth is the moment of intellectual reconstruction, where the inquirer puts together the results for themselves. Fifth is the moment of exposition, where we try to, to explain this, this dialectical grasp of, of, of the facts um, to others. And finally, sixth is the moment of, of praxis, where you consciously act in the world based on whatever clarification has been reached. And, and in so doing, you change it, you test the clarification, you deepen your understanding um, of it all at the same time. So this isn't a process, obviously, that's conducted just once, but over and over again. And, and the virtue, of, I think, of those six moments um, is that they, they embed the dialectical method as a practice within a social collective through exposition. Um, and they also include and emphasize the integral role of, of practice, of activity, which is always necessarily a, a part of the class struggle. Um, so I'll just finish by saying um, that, you know, beyond the method itself, it's worth remembering that dialectic is, is not simply a thought process. It, it's, it's in and of the world itself. Um, in strict terms, the, the thought process is really a method of abstraction, the one based on dialectics. There's also there's a di direction to the movement of the dialectic, um, not in the, the Hegelian sense that there's some end or absolute idea that we're aiming for, you know, the, the materialist dialectic is open-ended, but rather we are looking at forms of, of emerging, maturing, dec declining and, and dying. Um, as a as a little Tickton's pointed out, um, you know, this is something experienced by all physical and social entities, things come into being, mature, decline and die. And this can happen almost all at once or over centuries, but 
these forms are um, an integral part of the dialectic. Now, there is the fifth form, of course, and that's transition, um, where, as we've already discussed, there's a systemic shift. And the point to emphasize here is that there is nothing in the dialectic that suggests this is inevitable. You know, in, in many ways, you know, socialism or barbarism still applies. The, the historical social form that we inhabit today, the nature of class relations, the systemic form of positive and resolved contradictions and everything else we've discussed do delineate certain parameters or possibilities for historical development. And, you know, the new system in the womb of the old is, is clearly socialism. And it seems clear to me that capitalism is in decline and we are in a transitional period now. But that in itself is no guarantee that socialism will be born, not without class struggle and, and the movement of the working class. Um, so just to finish, I, I said I'd mentioned some of the different interpretations of, of Marxist dialectics. I'll do that very quickly now. The interpretation that I've, that I've provided in this introduction is, is broadly the, the classical form of the materialist dialectic that's developed by Engels, taken up by Lenin and Trotsky. Um, that is the version um, popularly known as dialectical materialism um, that was developed by the Stalinists and, of course, codified by Stalin himself. And you know, needless to say, it presents a, a simplistic, uh, mechanical and vulgar account of the materialist dialectic. And it didn't really lead to, to anything of any real use. Um, and incidentally, the term dialectical materialism isn't, isn't one used by, by Marx or, or Engels, but originates with, with Dietzkin. Um, I think materialist dialectics is, 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 is preferable to avoid any confusion with the, the Stalinist version. And of course, the, the Marxist left hasn't been immune from the effects of Stalinism. Another interpretation that in many ways has, has continuity with it is, is, is that of the, the work of um, Althusser, um, who effectively seeks to, to divorce Hegel from Marx by arguing that there's a, there's a clean break between the views of the young Marx and the mature Marx, and that the dialectical materialism represents a new philosophy completely independent of, of Hegel's dialectic. Um, obviously, you expect some of used to develop as they mature, but, but beyond the, um, the evidence and, and the method itself that's on display in Capital Volume 1, for example, there are numerous examples of Marx discussing his critical application of Hegelian method right through to the 1870s. Um, and again, I'm not, I, I, won't, I won't dwell on that, and possibly that will kind of come out in the, in the, in the discussion. And finally, um, as I mentioned before, there's the attempt to divorce Marx from Engels. Um, and, and in some ways, this is a reaction to the, you know, the bastardization of the dialectic um, promoted by the Stalinists, but it's still, in my view, a mistake. And clearly, Marx primarily applies the dialectical method to his analysis of social, social labor. However, this doesn't entail that it has to be limited to that. Clearly, Marx is grappling with categories that have a far broader application. Than, and what's more, for the dialectic to be materialist in any meaningful sense, it has to be in the world. To restrict it to social relations is the same kind of mystification that Hegel subjects the dialectic to when, when he imprisons it within the idea. And I think the, the very last thing to say um, is that while Marx, Engels, Trotsky and Lenin clearly had views in the dialectic and developed it to greater or lesser extent, none left any great body of work on this subject. It has to be remembered that in the, the, the dialectics is very much a work in progress. It's not been handed down as a complete method, but it has to be discovered, you know, with the aid of, of Marx and Engels and so on, of course. But it still requires further development to, to fully understand it in, in, in all of its systematic complexities. So anyway, I, I think I've talked for long enough, so I'll, I'll stop there. I um, hope that's been, been useful everyone, for everyone and, and look forward to hearing um, everyone's contributions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, I found that very interesting and a you know, very clear summary. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting into some of the reading you've suggested. Um, a couple of comrades have uh, uh, put up their hands for questions, so um, I'll go, uh, go straight to them. Uh, first of all, uh, Tony Greenstein. You're muted, Tony. I know, I know. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for that very interesting talk. Uh, I, I wouldn't claim I understood all of it. Uh, I, I have a friend. He is a former bus uh, shop steward on the buses, and he's a revolutionary worker who swears by historical materialism, but he says that dialectical materialism is a form of voodoo magic, uh, uh, and he doesn't... Uh, set a lot of store by it. So I have a number of questions really, which uh, probably show my ignorance amongst other things, such as how does do dialectics impact on uh, our practice, the class struggle, or are they simply a means of understanding our existing situation, the contradictions which are thrown up in that struggle? Secondly, 
personally, I've always seen dialectics almost as a form of mystification in themselves, a, a way of blurring our understanding, and also as a means of control. You you refer uh, to the Stalinist dialectic, but also dialectics forms a, a, an important part of the means by which Jerry Healy controlled the WRP. And I think we all know how that turned out. Uh, thirdly, Hegel is described, you, you describe him as an idealist and that Marx in effect turned him on his head so that uh, the, the material world was uh, where the site of struggle was and ideas came from the material world, not the other way around. But my question is whether ideas in themselves, ideology, if you like, can itself mm. become a material force in mm. certain situations. And I've given the example, because it's the one I know best, where anti-Semitism in Germany continued and became a force, a political force, even though the conditions which gave birth to it and gave rise to it had actually disappeared. I mean, feudalism. I mean, it was a social and economic position of Jews within the feudal structure, which gave birth to what we know as anti-Semitism. And of course, anti-Semitism changed. But the Nazi party borrowed from that feudal heritage. There's absolutely no doubt about it. So that's another question that I, I want to uh, give you. Whether ideas, because of the momentum they gather, can become almost a force in themselves, independently of the material conditions. Thanks. OK, thanks, Tony. Um, Lawrence Parker, I think, uh, wants to come in. Hi, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, Lawrence. Hi, um, um, uh, Tony raised some interesting points uh, uh, just then. I mean, first of all, I think anybody, I've only briefly looked at Jerry Healy's writings on dialectics, but I can tell Tony um, uh, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not the leading world genius on dialectics and philosophy, although I've read a bit, but I can tell you much that what Jerry Healy writes, it's gobbledygook, it's rubbish. If you look at what Jerry Healy writes about Hegel, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, so, uh, so I think in that circumstance, I think Tony's quite right to call it that kind of dialectic, dialectical gobbledygook, which is just using long words to cover up a fairly unpleasant party regime, I think is, I think that's quite right to call that mystification and, and, and crap, actually, uh, just useless crap. Um, on the ideas and material force thing, I mean, I agree with Tony completely on that, but then it's, a, it's, a, it's only because ideas have got a physical element to them because they you know they're made our brains and there's chemical processes in the brains it's only it's only it's only the vagaries of kind of western philosophy has developed under Descartes that you see your mind and body as being two separate things anyway obviously they have got entity and difference but your your mind is in your body and it's part of your physical processes and if i don't know if I starve myself for the next five days or I just live off of crisps, I, don't, I won't be coming up with very good thoughts. There is a kind of relationship between the two. But I think the ideas as material force thing, I think that's, I think that's a kind of really kind of uh, profound ideas. But then it, it kind of goes on. Ideas take a material force and then the material practice of uh, those ideas reacts back and reformulates those ideas and vice versa it goes on in a long kind of process so um but yeah on the on the talk i i thought christopher gave a you know a really good talk and i don't want this taken as um me being um overly o overly kind of, kind of critical because it's an incredibly hard job to introduce this topic in in 30 minutes without kind of vulgarizing it a bit and and, um, and making it a bit kind of straightforward but I do have a slight problem with the kind of mode of presentation I mean Christopher talked at the end about um, uh, the need need for this all to become very concrete um, if you're going to talk about dialectics, you need also to have that kind of relationship that uh, the Soviet philosopher Lyankov talked about, which was a book called The Dialectics of the Abstract and Concrete in Marx's Capital, i.e. I've, I've got a slight problem with this idea of, 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 of talking about a set of laws and a set of formulations 
and then applying those laws. Now, I'm pretty so certain Christopher wouldn't do that in kind of real life, if, if you know what I mean. But um, to me, is a, a lot of comrades you meet on the left use these kind of Engels type laws, which in and in of themselves are perfectly, uh, perfectly acceptable kind of of introductions to dialectics but then you have this idea that you have law and then you apply that law to reality that's not really how well it's not how I learned dialectics I found that an actual to, to read angles and then to start trying to apply that to things I, I, I found that a useless and what I actually did when I got interested in dialectics is I started applying it to historical investigations that I was doing and I used the historical in investigations then to see, you know, what light shine back on or kind of theoretical works that I, I, you know, I've read. I, I, if you, you kind of need this idea of the concrete in, in front of you all the time, because otherwise, if you don't have that idea of concretion uh, practice in front of you all the time, you just end up coming up with something that is kind of quite uh, uh, abstract and, uh, uh, you know, and it can veer on the kind of gobbledygook that Healy kind Kind of provided well not, not that bad uh, hopefully the last the last couple of things i'll talk about is i do have a slight problem with christopher's talking um christopher again it's, hegel is a, a gigantic subject to cover in this kind of time period chris did use the word mystical in the relationship to hegel and it's perfectly true that hegel in terms of his dialectic overall he did mystify it and it and it is for the reasons that christopher said that it's a you know it's a, it's a treatise of ideas rather than as practice but you have to say when you read hegel as i've done a fair amount of in the last couple of years when you read hegel's aesthetics or if you read his actual lecture to his student, if you read the phenomenology, uh, if you read the science of logic uh, uh, as well, the, these things appear to me, uh, uh, s some of his works are saturated in history, uh, uh, is and you can read about those in a book. Lukács wrote a book called The Young Hegel, which referred to, which referred to uh, Hegel's delvings into uh, the economics and various other kind of subjects in the so-called real world. Uh, but also you find that in Kant as well. Some people take Kant as being the ultimate uh, subjectivist kind of philosopher, just interested in ideas, just interested in a critique of reason and ideas. But Kant's book is actually haunted by the idea of objectivity, the things in themselves. The things in themselves are what promote or what provoke your sensations, your sensibility in the first place. So you, you kind of read these books and you read the textbook summation of them, that they're idealist, they're abstract, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when you actually read them. And then it also as well in the science of logic, Hegel seems to worry all the time in the science of logic that the concepts, the speculative reason, isn't coming to terms with reality kind of properly. And Adorno's written quite a lot on this, the way that in the science of logic, there's this kind of gap. And Hegel's always reaching for things, there's always room for reality that he suspects is going to screw up his, his kind of speculative reason. And that happens in Kant's critique of pure reason too. So um, so I, I don't I don't agree that um, that that Hegel was like a pure mystic and I think that you we have to work through Hegel rather than I don't think Marx's thing about turning it upside down I think is maybe it's a translation but I don't think it's kind of it almost it almost it, you have to work through Hegel you can't like leap over him and just jump over him and uh, you know in some respects you'd have to say that Marx was profoundly influenced by, by Kant and Hegel as Christopher kind of outlines. And the last thing is Christopher drew a reference uh, to Trotsky as a dialectician quite a lot during this. I think quite rightly, because I think um, uh, Trotsky's from about 1933, I think they were. Very profound book, and, and I think Trotsky understood dialectics very well, although I don't like his presentation because he goes through the law thing when he's presenting it to his boys in the fourth international a bit too much but uh, Trotsky understood that you know the, fl the flux and the fluid nature of concepts and he understood the dialectic and the process of change the problem I find with 
Trotsky is when you look to the, his latter years, when you look to some of the some of the later practice that happened in the Fourth International, for example, Trotsky's ide political ideas, like he had the idea at the end of the purifying split, when he was um, dealing, I think, with the followers of Burnham and um, mm -hmm. other people like that, who he split within the USSWP. Um, Trotsky doesn't really follow that dialectic through because actually, you know, the kind of uh, difference the differences, the unity and difference that, you know, you have as the dialectic, Trotsky couldn't follow that through. And so he ended up creating a sect, really, in the end. And what we see in the Fourth International subsequent to that was just a series of sects. That's not Trotsky's fault. Trotsky wasn't around to, to comment on that. But I just, so I'll just say to that, I think Trotsky is a very great dialectician, but I do think towards the end of his life, I think his, his thoughts suffered in that. Because whereas earlier on, Trotsky had a very clear idea of party regimes being open and having different ideas in amongst their basic kind of unity, which is a very clear and profound dialectical kind of conception. Trotsky never saw that kind of thing through. That's it. Sorry for yakking on. And it's OK, Lawrence. I, um, I'm a very indulgent uh, chair, as, uh, as you can see. Um, and there were some very interesting questions. Uh, Christopher, do you want to come back now or shall I take the next two speakers? Um, I'm, I'm happy to come back very briefly. Um, yeah, if you would, and because there were some quite complex uh, ideas and then I'll bring in Liv and then Tina. Yeah, so, I, so I've done my best to kind of take notes of the, of, the, of the questions as they came in, but forgive me if I, if I have um, kind of misunderstood any. Yeah, so just in, 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 in terms of what um, Tony was saying um, with... Um, the nature of, of ideas like I, I i agree i think that's a very it's a very important point um and i i agree with what what, what lauren said you know if, if you have a materialist materialist conception of reality then then you you have to take ideas seriously as as a material um force and and there isn't a sense i don't think um in in the materialist dialectic where you have this kind of mechanical relationship between um you know the material and, and 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 ideas in the same way that you don't have a mechanical relationship between um, the economy and 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 and, and politics. You know there's it, there's a two way relationship there. It's 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 complex. Um, and you know the the, the example that I provided is is is, a, is an excellent one where you, there is you know on the face of it no material basis um, at, at that point in history um, for anti semitism, but. Um, clearly, it represents a significant force. So um, that's that a, a really good point. Um, I think, I, I, in terms of dialectics as a, as a means of mystification, as a means of control, then you know, absolutely. And I, I mentioned very, very briefly the kind of the Stalinist approach um, to dialectics. But yeah, you could you can quite easily include figures like Jerry Healy in that as well. I mean, you, you know, take your pick. I mean, obviously, he's a particularly um, bad example, but take your pick of various. Um, of the of the kind of far left sects, each with its own um, guru who can justify you know whatever they like on the basis of you know a dialectical understanding which is not available to to the members, um, but I think the, the response to that is is to is to try and understand it better ourselves rather than to reject it. Um, not that I'm suggesting that's what you were you were um, suggesting we do, but just I think you know the, the answer to that is is to is to to engage more with dialectics rather than less. Um, and in terms of dialectics in the class struggle, you know, I, I spoke about that, you know, um, in, in the talk a, a little bit, um, you know, the relation between the two, um, you know, ultimately dialectics provides you with a means of understanding the world and that can inform the way in which you, you engage in the class struggle. But the class struggle itself, the, the actual process of class struggle then, in a, a kind of circular fashion also, um, changes the world and, and, and changes your understanding of it. So again, there's this kind of, I think there's this kind of two-way subjective objective um, relation going on. Um, Lawrence, I think um, I, I, I think your you know your criticism is very very fair, and and I I, I really agree. Um, I think broadly with 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 what you said, and you know it's 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 difficult to kind of cover everything in, in thirty minutes. Um, yeah, I don't think the laws that Engel sets out can can be applied ready made, and I was you know trying to emphasize at the end of, of my introduction that dialectics is a, is a work in progress um, it's it's not a kind of handbook that, that has been that's been handed down from from on high um, I certainly also don't think that, that Hegel should should not 
shouldn't be read, it should be dismissed as a as, a, as an idealist, as someone who simply is engaged in mystification. Um, you know, the um the phenomenology, I think, in particular, is is um, you know, it's not it's not what you would expect um from someone that you can kind of offhandly dismiss as a as an idealist. And you know, beyond Kant, there's there's Leibniz as well and Spinoza, and that there are there are lots of of um you know idealist philosophers that are that are worth engaging with and 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 thinking about um seriously. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with your point about Trotsky. Obviously, the, as I said, the dialectic is not—it's not a handbook. It doesn't guarantee that you come to the correct conclusions, but it's, it's, a, um, it's the kind of the, the, the best method, um, you know, as it were, that's, that's, that's available to us. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let people continue with um, contributions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next comrade, uh, Liv. Okay. Hello. <clears throat> yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Liv. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, first of all, thanks very much um, to Chris. I thought that was a, an excellent um, presentation. Um, I actually want to take this in a different direction now, and at the risk of um, being charged with mysticism, um, I see an awful lot of um, similarities, links between Eastern philosophy of um, Taoism, of yin, you know, the yin-yang theory, and uh, dialectical materialism, the um, whole um, process of um, opposites, contradictions, um, constantly uh, changing, constantly in motion, and one is contained within the other. If you think of the yin-yang sign, which everyone I'm sure is uh, familiar with, the black and white, um, symbol which is interlinked and at the heart of one is the um the beginning of the other and vice versa and in many ways um i think it's a uh, visual um, presentation of what um marx's uh, <clears throat> dialectical materialism is um presenting as an understanding of how the world works in a very you know, graphic form. And it's one that I think people um, can readily understand, and I, uh, which I personally think is extremely useful. Um, as, as people have said before, I mean, Chris's presentation was absolutely excellent. It's extremely hard for many people to follow, though, um, the detail that um, that he uses, you know, in in explaining how um, how it works. Whereas when you look at the yin yang theory, which is essentially, to my mind, exactly the same, I would say, I would say, as an understanding of how the process works. Obviously, uh, with yin yang and with Taoism. You're not talking, uh, you know. Um, there, there isn't a political um, uh, thesis put on top of the um, yin yang theory itself, but you can adapt it to any circumstance in the world because it is a basic level of understanding the processes of how the world works. And to pick up also on what uh, Tony was saying, I would agree with him. I, don't, I personally don't think that um, with dialectical materialism, it, sh it, it necessarily excludes uh, dialectics of ideas because clearly, you know, the two are working together. Uh, if you think of um, ideas, um, how, we, how we form ideas and how the ideas we hold, most of us hold contradictory ideas in our heads at any one time. So the level of contradictions is there at literally every level throughout, whether you're talking about um, the, the atm how atoms are made up or whether you're looking at the universe and how uh, planets are revolving around stars. I mean, however, however you look and however you want to understand the world, it all comes down to this relationship between one thing and the other and how that and how one thing does relate to another. And it's not, I think one of the advantages possibly in looking at it through yin yang 
is it's not uh, totally um, on, this, on the basis of contradiction in the sense of struggle one thing against the other, because there can also be attractions. And so within yin yang, within that um, black and white symbol, you've got two things at work. You've got, of course, the struggle um, against, so one thing um, repelling and, and forcing against the other, but you've also got a level of attraction as well. And I think, um, yeah, as I say, I'll leave it there. I mean, my, my, I feel that my understanding of Eastern philosophy has certainly enriched my understanding of um, Marx's dialectical materialism. I'll leave it there. I realise that it's. I realise it's a different view <laughs> to most people's. Thanks, Liv. Um, and some interesting ideas there. Uh, Tina Bergman, next, please. Hi. Uh, yes, I, I did like the yin yang thing as well. I think I mentioned it as well in one in one session. But I have thought about it some more. Actually, I think it's it's not adequate uh, anymore because it's a particular snapshot, isn't it? A particular time. Um, it almost gives the impression it's it will repeat itself and it will go on and on and on. Whereas I think for me, um, dialectics and I, you know, I cannot say that I, I uh, understand all the laws, et cetera, whatever um, that, that um, um, the comrade Chris has gone through in, in so much detail. It was very fascinating. I can't, can't profess to be an expert or understand them all, but for me, always dialectical materialism was a very hopeful idea, you know, that, that things are constantly in flux that things constantly have to change, that with something being born, it always already contains the seeds of its own destruction, which you know doesn't sound so nice when you're talking about human beings, but it's if you're thinking about social systems and and uh, and you know the forces of production, they will have to change. They've been co going through constant change throughout throughout history, and nothing has to stay the way it is. Nothing has been the same for for centuries. You know, things always change. So a lot of people, you know, this the end of history uh, type idea. Fukuyama, you know, capitalism is it. You know, that's the peak of civilization. You can't get better than that. This is the best it can be. And clearly, you know, sort of if you if you if you look at dialectic materialism, that clearly shows that to be absurd. Nothing ever stays the same, even if we have. Uh, socialism, communism, it will go through various transformations all the time. And I think for, for me, the one sentence that really sums it up really well is in, I think it's in the Communist Manifesto, uh, where, where Marx says, you know, the, the working class is the grave digger of capitalism, which without capitalism, the working class wouldn't even exist. So capitalism gave birth to the working class, but the working class will be the one once it's strong enough and developed enough to kill it and you know to bring it to an end and that is a necessity it necessarily has to be so other things can happen i agree with chris but you know logically etc if if the working class can become stronger again that the, it it has the potential at least the working class has the potential to to kill off capitalism at a certain stage this is also explains a certain uh, why you know revolutions some not always happen or don't always are successful um perhaps because they they couldn't be you know for example when the, when the chartists you know how many millions of people um rallied behind the chartists and tried to you know try to fight for better conditions and make revolution you know they they kind of failed sadly um could they have ever one, you know, there's a certain question, does capitalism have to go to a certain stage before it can be overthrown? And perhaps it couldn't at that time, perhaps it even, you know, it was difficult for in Russia, wasn't it 1918 capitalism in Russia had not become very developed. In fact, it was hardly there. The working class was very small. Feudalism was still very strong. The working class certainly made a revolution but you know it didn't lead to socialism it came became to something quite different there's a question now, could it ever have become socialism at that stage when the capitalist forces were so low that the working class couldn't just take them over couldn't make a, you know couldn't 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 uh, easily pr provide everybody with food shelter etc because the productive forces were just not there at the time, you know. So it's an interesting, interesting question. I think it's a very hopeful idea that, you know, when the time is ripe, we will be able to to overthrow. 
not leaving aside, you know, we, we have to we have to be ready for it. I mean, this capitalist system could go on and on and on for some for some time, um, although it's clearly in decline now and is not at the height of its power. But without without a force there to to you know kick it over, kick it out of the way, will be very difficult. Um, I was going to say something about anti-Semitism, but there's so many people indicating now. I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tina. Uh, Sandy McBurney. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm just on my phone here. I thought yeah, Chris, that's fine, Sandy. You can hear me. Chris's introduction was really interesting and, and very clear. I've just got a few observations to make. One, we don't really have any substantial work on the materialist dialectic, you know, which is itself rather surprising. There's bits that Trotsky wrote in defence of Marxism, etc. You can you, there's bits and pieces. There's bits Marx himself, obviously, but you don't have any substantial work and that itself I find rather strange you know I mean I've been involved in 50 years in the movement and we still don't have any substantial work and the, there's been attempts you know Alan Woods uh, and Ted Grant had that book on trying to bring uh, the dialectics of nature up to date that was generally considered a failure I would say but uh, we, we, we are missing such a work right and the second thing is just a query about why since science has developed so much in the last hundred years, human knowledge is so much greater than it was. Why in the various fields, like in physics, et cetera, and computing science and med in med medical advances, et cetera, why are dialectics never mentioned by the main a protagonists or the, the people that are in the, he the head of the fields in these cases, they never seem to need to use that method. And that's the, the thing that calls me, calls it into doubt to some degree. I mean, if it's a method of discovering reality and revealing reality, when human knowledge has advanced so much in various spheres, yet they don't use dialectics, at least not consciously. There's a scientific method that they don't refer to as being dialectics. I think everyone refers now to materialism. There's very few idealists or, you know, certainly kind of any religious ideas don't play any prominence in, in scientific advance, but dialectics are not put forward by anyone in any of the fields of human knowledge at the moment in the forefront of, it, of any of the fields. And I find that rather strange and something that we would have to account for. Really, those are my, my observations. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Sandy. Uh, Anne McShane. Anne McShane. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here, Kevin. I'm not going to put my video on because um, I'm in my lab. Uh, it's a bit of a bug, so I won't subject you to me. Anyway. Um, Okay, so that was all very interesting. And some of the points that people have raised have been very, very thought provoking. I wanted to ask Chris, um, he mentioned in his talk about the arguments put forward by Marx insofar as basically the new society developed within the old and would not be able to, I suppose, supersede the old until the conditions were right. And Tina mentioned that um, as well in her contribution about the time being right. So I think I don't agree with that precisely because I think that, you know, firstly, how are you going to know um, whether the time is right? You know, you get the opportunity obviously to make a revolution it can be difficult to know whether the time is right, but generally what people do, what political parties do is take a risk. Like they took a risk with the Paris Commune, Lenin, the Bolsheviks, they took a risk. We, were, we, we are constantly discussing the ramifications of that risk that they took in conditions where, you know, it was clear that capitalism wasn't, uh, you know, the Soviet Union or the, the Tsarist state was not ready for socialism. But even within that process, certainly for the first 10 years, you can see some very interesting developments taking place. And I myself have studied the work of the Women's Commission and their work in Central Asia, which was certainly not, and in any sense, you could call it capitalism. It was a peasant society. But, you know, they did very many interesting things 
and they developed women's uh, freedoms in, in ma many ways which continue to find reflection after even the, after 1928 and you know yet to this day um, they're, 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 it's left an imprint so I think myself that it's not a case of kind of awaiting the correct time but for dealing as effectively as you can with the circumstances that you're in and while recognizing at the same time the limitations of those circumstances. So um, that's the first point. And the second point really relates a little bit to what Tony said earlier and what other people have said and also Sandy mentioned is that what is the relevance of dialectics to us in a practical sense today? It seems to me from what Chris has said that they're utterly completely and profoundly uh, important for us, that we really need to grasp dialectics and the dialectical method in order to be able to understand our world more effectively and, you know, argue for, win over the working class and for the working class to be able to understand the world it wants to change. But yes, we don't engage with them. We only do it every now and again at a talk. And most people, a little bit like me, are a little bit ignorant or, or you know, um, intimidated by them. Um, so that, that, they're the points that I wanted to make about the question of the timing been right and the question of the utilisation of dialectics. Thanks. OK, thanks, Anne. Uh, I've got two further comrades who want to come in. Uh, I think I'll take them and then I'll ask uh, Chris to sum up. Uh, I think that would probably be the easiest way. OK, uh, Diana, if you'd like to come in, please. All right. Well First, that thank, thanks to Chris, you've covered an awful lot, and I found too much to take in at once. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that actually um, ties in with a point Sandy was making. But you said, said about um, uh, bourgeois thought, looking at the um, parts of a system, which um, I, I interpret as being um, reductive logic. So um, if, if you're looking, um, when it comes to so, some sort of part of science, such as um, genetics, where it really doesn't work, you try and apply reductionism. Um, so I'm thinking that dialectics um, would look at, look at um, something that a system as a whole rather than look, looking using reductionism and say, saying that the um, reduction is implying it but um, reductionism is bourgeois which um, could interpret as being capitalist um, and uh, an example that, um, that I, I'm very much into um, environmental stuff an exa a particular example that um, I've been concerned about is um, current pressure to um, claim that um, genetic editing is not genetic mo modification. And that, that relies on um, reductionist thought and, and I say that, um, that genetic expression um, Work, works in such a way that you can accurately take a particular gene and change it and you're not going to get lots of errors. In fact, that's not the way genetic expression works. It's, it, it's um, an integrated sy system. Um, so the, the, the parts of the way it works are, are um, greater than the whole. And there, was a, there was another point. Oh, somebody came up about um, mentioned that was uh, you perceive relating. I, oh, I can't remember exactly what they said, but it was if effectively perceiving um, an object that uh, uh, you take the thing in itself, and it's the the object that. Um, you sense that you perceive. That's that's not the case. In fact, it's uh, it is actually um, a process that um, enables sentient beings to 
um, perceive what's happening. Because um, if, if you look at the um, neural science be behind um, perception, in fact, it, it, it is a, it's a process and it's a very complex process. And in fact, um, say you perceive hot and cold, what you're perceiving is changes. Um, in what what you're sensing, um, and it's the same when when you with with vision you 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 actually perceive changes between light and dark or changes be between colours. Um, I don't know if I'm making much sense. I think I've um, probably covered what I wanted to. Okay, th thanks. Uh, I certainly like the idea of process and uh, particularly uh, when I'm up early in the morning, I see the dawn coming on. I certainly get that idea of the change from dark to light. Okay, uh, last comrade, uh, Matthew Jones. Oh uh, yeah, thank you comrades. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, yeah, good. Okay, no, I, I thought Chris's uh, contribution was really good um, and important and I hope that lots of people watch it on video. And we can have a further discussion. I think it, it, it opens up um, a lot of things, and you know, it's the sort of discussion we should we should be having. I think there's, I mean, I think you know, obviously we live in a very very difficult time. I think is the first thing to say. I mean, obviously, you know, conditions under which I mean, you know, I mean, Trotsky in, in famously in this in, the, in his opening to the transitional program points to the uh, to the the rot. The rotten nature of the system. I mean, the system can only be termed gangrenous now. I mean, you're actually living in a, in a time of social decay, um, in a time in which the, 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 the capitalist class itself is, 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 is almost nakedly parasitic on the system. I mean, it, it, it's actually now clearly an obstruction to the development of, of, of both the society and the productive forces, um, and, 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 and lives, you know, on the basis of, as I say, of of, of financial parasitism, much of it, um, you know, and, and you know, under these conditions, it's uh, you know very difficult to, to develop, you know, a, a serious, um, you know, political, you know, in many ways, a political movement or a political critique, precisely because of that, they, they actually have provoked and, and, and then seek to break down um, all forms of, 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 of organisation. You can see it, you know, even in the, in the basis of, of, of the modern workplace in which now, you know, now of course, um, so much is, is, is divided up into small, into smaller and smaller units, purely in order to maintain control. Um, it, you know, as, 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 as the bourgeoisie seeks to, 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 to hold on to its grasp and at the same time, obviously, um, you know, applies you know, methods that, that, that barbarians wouldn't recognize to, to, to maintain its control of humanity. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, the, the, the choice socialism of barbarism is not, you know, we've, we've, we've got barbarism, that, that's it, that's where we're at. Um, the question is how, how do we get out of it? Um, I do like, I mean, I think the other thing about, about Marx, of course, is his, his, his ontology of, of humanity, that it's, a, it's an arc. Um, you know, um, and then obviously the whole question of the, the, um, the object, again, I mean, what we confront now, which is the, the objective... Uh, moment, the objective um, importance of, of, of the subjective understanding, you know, how, how, you, how organized, the organized working class in particular, how it understands what it should be doing and what its own task is or how, you know, the, the, to, to what degree or otherwise it understands has now become a key, a key part of, 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 of history and of, and of the organization of society and the, and the progress or absence of it of the society. Um, I think the other thing is, is, is I mean, as Sandy say, says about, about science, I, I think, you know, obviously that, that nature of the human society moment obviously affects science um, to, to, to a huge degree. I mean, it, it is itself, you know, the practice of science itself has been atomized, been, been, been attacked by, with use, use of, uh, of precarity on, on the practitioners, um, the, um, the, 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 you know, in fact, of course, the, I, mean, I you know, I think that also, I mean, to me, the, 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 the capitalist class itself does not want to, to, to understand some of the fundamental questions. I mean, if you look at, if we look at them, say, for instance, the, the current theory of physics, the sort of the, the standard model, as it's known, it's actually anti-materialist, mm -hmm. you know, 
And this, this actually was the whole question. If you look at the, 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 the debate between Einstein and Niels Bohr, it was over, you know, because Einstein was a materialist. He was against it. You know, this is his whole thing. God does not play dice, which is, you know, which is not about, you know, it's a, a religion. What it mean, what it meant was that, 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 that Einstein was saw that the world had to have causality, that some, uh, you know, point, something happened, and then there was, there was cause and effect. And of course, that doesn't exist in the standard model of physics, you know, because it, it's probability. <laughs> And, and other such. I mean, there's, there's, there's key there's key points. I, don't, I think you know you can make a you can make a critique of the practice of modern science by use of by, by use of dialectic rather than rather than the other way around. And I, you know, I think that, that that that's important. And as I say, also of course understanding as I say the state, the rotten state of modern society. You know, which is unfortunately where we're at. Um, and of course the left and the, the effect of ongoing and, and baleful effect of Stalinism. Upon the left, the fact that you had the you know the finest exponents and practitioners of revolution, the, the, you know, were, were systematically exterminated. It's done us no favor. You know, it leaves us in this situation, in which you know we you know many of the tools we should have had we haven't got. Um, but I think I, I'm I'm really encouraged by by what what Chris has Chris has said tonight. I hope that was really good. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew, and. Uh... Thanks for the comrades for contributing. Um, I've got, uh, I'm going to use my chair's privilege just to ask a question which I think links a few of the other questions. And it's really about the importance of the, the dialectic, Chris. Um, I recall Trotsky in defense of Marxism uh, refers to, he actually says a young English professor and the young English professor who he's talking to says that he doesn't, he isn't a follower of the dialectic. And Trotsky makes, uh, I think, a point, it's in relation to the debate with Burnham, uh, about, um, you know, from a scratch to gangrene. In other words, that the dialectic and an understanding of the dialectic is absolutely essential. And I think that lurking behind some of the questions that comrades have is whether it's necessary to be a serious revolutionary or a serious socialist and to actually uh, adhere to the idea of the dialectic. So I just wondered if you could perhaps explain the significance of that. And, and in particular, in, in Marx's thought, um, you know, is it necessary for people who either don't understand or regard it as a mystification or unnecessary, um, is it really necessary for people to use this pattern of thought um, is, is the question. It's a very, very naive question, but I think it's, uh, lurks behind some of the things that people have said. Okay, uh, over to you now, Chris, to sum up. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'll try and get through as many of those as I, I can. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe take Kevin, Kevin's um, first, just because it's kind of fresh in the mind. Um, you know, the question about the necessity of understanding dialectics. So yeah, I mean, I agree that's, that it's, like, it's, it's been a common theme to, to many of the, the contributions. Um, but I think the one that, that, that is most pertinent um, to me for that is, is, is the example that um, I think Tony gave um, back at the, the beginning um, of, of, of Jerry Healy. And the question is, you know, do you want a system or a, a situation where you have a, a kind of almost like a priestly caste who understand this stuff um, and come up with the analysis and the role of everyone else is to, is to accept that and to, to act accordingly? I think, you know, as as Matthew said, you know the, the the subjective consciousness of the working class is 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 really is is crucial here, and and you know this it, it's difficult stuff, and I I wouldn't pretend to 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 have a, a a complete grasp of it. I don't think anyone really does, um, but it's it, it's worth engaging with and worth trying to understand because it allows you to to operate at a, a, a kind of a political level. Um, that guards against, in many ways, um, the kind of abuses that, that you've seen with the Stalinists or Healy or, or whoever else, um, where you have the kind of the gurus who, who hand down um, the knowledge from on high, it gives you the critical tools to understand, well, actually, no, that's not the case, you know, this is what's going on here, or, um, the, you know, that it's a lot more complicated than this, or in the case of Healy, this one comrade said, you know, yeah, that's just, it's just nonsense. Um, and obviously, you know, Lenin famously said after um, reading Hegel, you know, that, that um, because Marxists um, hadn't, hadn't um, 
hadn't read Hegel, the um, consequence was that um, many of them simply didn't understand Marx. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's not a scholastic question, it's, 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 it's active, I think, um, and it's important that we that we can we continue to to engage with it, and I think you know I was, I was going to say in my in my summing up is that it's important to do it. Um, uh, it can be done on your own. Basically, it needs to be done through through discussions like this. It's it's, it's very difficult to sit on your own and and, and read Hegel um, and and, and uh, try and work out what's going on. So it requires discussion to try and bring these topics out and to to kind of deepen our understanding. Um, so I'll go back to. Um, or if I forgetting people's um, names, I think written down. So I think Liv was talking about the similarities of Eastern philosophy. You know, I think the dialectic is is, is pretty present um, in, in human thought. You know, all along um, there's 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 there's, um, there's plenty of kind of dialectical thought within within the ancient Greeks. You know, Heraclitus, for example. You know, the, the notion of the, the river that you can never step in twice. That's it's a it's a dialectical expression. Um, and certainly in Eastern philosophy, that this, this the same is true, and and Eastern philosophy was was, was very. I know I know that um, from my own reading that it was, was very influential on 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 people like um, uh, Leibniz who were who were starting to develop, you know, these notions of of identity and difference. I think you know the yin and yang. I, I, I you know I, I don't maybe completely agree with that. That it, um, I mean it's it's a possibly it's a it's a means of aiding understanding um but i think it, i think it requires a bit more than that i think it's the, the concept is, is more complicated and, and and needs to be kind of um worked through there's there's no shortcut i think effectively to trying to 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 communicate stuff you know it's about people thinking and, and learning how to think um critically and for, and for themselves and that's what we should be encouraging rather than um trying to simplify um the stuff um and then you know you mentioned kind of contradiction um, and in thought, and you know obviously clearly people hold contradictory ideas, but you know we have to be careful that we don't we don't use the dialectic as a as a means of kind of glossing over, um, you know genuine contradictory as an error, which you know Marx recognizes through his work is forever accusing people of contradicting themselves. It's not the same thing as the kind of contradiction um, that we're that we're talking about here. Um, I don't think. Um, I think moving on to Tina's points, you know, dialectics, um, it does provide an optimistic account, um, you know, thing that, and, and certainly the, the notion that capitalism is in any way like an impermanent form of society is just patent nonsense. Um, and, you know, Marx writes as well, obviously, about the, um, the this current period being a, a kind of prehistory of human history, the, the real histories um, uh, yet to begin. And obviously, within within a, a, a communist society, the, the dialectic doesn't doesn't cease to operate at that point. It's, it's contradiction is open ended. Things continue to, to progress and um, and and change. Um, but you know, possibly it's just my own disposition. But I, you know, there are there are reasons to be optimistic. There are also reasons to be pessimistic. You know, you can't underestimate the challenges, that, the existential challenges that, that we face as humanity, um, and certainly not aided by a, a, a declining. Um, and thoroughly, you know, putrid um, capitalist class that's, that's, that's running things. Um, so Sandy uh, mentioned the, the fact that there's no substantial work on, on materialist dialectics, which you know, I, I think is a, is, a, is a source of, of regret and is something that, that we, should, we should, you know, um, as a movement seek to rectify. Um, and the question of why, why are dialectics not used in the natural sciences, um, again, I, I, I I think Matthew answered that that point um, relatively well. I mean, the the method that's employed generally is the is the is the, is the empirical method, and you know, as, as I said, even regarding um, kind of classical form of logic, you know, it, it does have its uses, um, but it is still possible to subject the whole the whole thing to to a dialectical um, critique. And and for example, yes, you can say certain things about the nature of physical reality at a certain point at a certain time, but you can't then use these methods to say, you know, what's the nature of the Labour Party. You still need to be able to have an understanding of process of things developing through history. Um, and again, it's as I said, I think in the introduction, it's, it's a way of, you know, it's a way of carving up the world into units that you then seek to understand where one thing starts, when the other thing ends. Um, Anne's point about the the notion of the, you know, the, the the new society within within the old. 
you know, how do you know when when the time is is right? Well, clear, you know, clearly you don't, um, the, and clearly there have been, you know, experiments. You, know, you could call them, I suppose, in, in terms of social revolution, and um, that have provided um, extremely valuable lessons and have constituted in many ways real steps forward for the working class. You know, obviously, October nineteen seventeen being been the principal one, but I think the thing is that what we're talking about here is, is is a world system. We're talking about something that is systemic, and we're talking about the, the dominant social form that exists within that system. Um, and so, really, you do have a question. It's a question: Is it you know, is it is it capitalism or is it socialism? You know, there, there, there's not there's nothing else. Um, and um, insofar as, as as any kind of revolutions have, have, have taken place, they have they have failed to to affect the the this the kind of transformation, the, the full negation of the negation that, that that is required. So we can, you know, it's not the dialectic shouldn't be, I don't think, used as a kind of means of embracing a kind of centrist Marxism where the revolution is forever tomorrow. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's 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 not um, you know, there hasn't thus far been you know a successful um revolution i think you need to you need to kind of acknowledge that um and then you know what the what's the the, the relevance of 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 dialectics um and i think again that is something that um you know if we think about for example the nature of the labor party um you know do you understand the labor party in 2015 when jeremy corbyn becomes leader and then say well you know we all have to rush in and, and join and support this which many of us did including myself but you also then have to understand that labor party is a as a, as a party of, of counter-revolution that that's one of its primary functions is is to um is to suppress the, the, the working class movement as a thoroughly contradictory nature. You only understand it through dialectics, and that's why you, you end up with a lot of the nonsense from um, you know social democratic um, comrades who um, who are, who kind of um, turn unity within the Labour Party unity with the right wing into some sort of um, uh, principle where you can you know if you a, a critical dialectic understanding um, of the situation allows you to to kind of see that for for the nonsense that it is. And obviously, I also like you to understand capitalism. We talked about, but I realise I'm kind of I'm battling on, so I'll just um, finish by um, just I think um, Diana was um, the other person who contributed in, in in terms of the notion of bourgeois thought. You know, I think that's you know in, in my introduction that the same that economists primarily are political economists who are um, kind of capitalist apologists who seek to kind of you know talk about you know production um, separately from. Um, um, consumption and that, that which is just no way of understanding um what's going on but i think as well you do have to to recognize that you know within the capitalist system the bourgeois class is the dominant class and it's, it's therefore it's, it's the dominant culture um and then yeah certainly the observations about perceptions of process i think it's is is uh is interesting and i think again that's it comes back to it's the way in which you you divide up um, material reality, the way in which you understand it, as, you know, as an instant or a snapshot, or as something that um, takes place over a longer period of time that involves process, and then the, the kind of the interconnectedness of of all things in in, in one relation or another. Um, so I, I I think I'll I'll leave it there and just um, say you know, thank you everyone for 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 coming along this evening. I thought the contribution was was really excellent, and um, I hope um, and we can we can. Um, you know, take it forward and, and continue discussing what's, uh, you know, an important topic. So thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, thanks to everybody else that contributed us questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I kicked <laughs> Kevin out. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to bring him back. Sorry, Kevin. Oops. Juggling my daughter. Sorry, I did a bad thing, you know. Erin? Sorry, Chris. Sorry, Kevin. Okay. Right, I was, I was just going to thank everybody and uh, to remind comrades that, uh, the, that tomorrow evening we'll have another educational session. Uh, Tony Greenstein is going to be um, doing a series of sessions, I think it's five, on the history of Zionism, Zionism past, present and future. And that will be at six o'clock tomorrow evening. 
the uh, the joining instructions are the same as for uh, this session this evening. And then next week we'll have um, the last uh, the last session in this section on Marxism, and I'll be talking about uh, about Parliament and Marxists in the enemy camp. So that'll be next week. But I hope to see you all tomorrow um, at uh, Tony Greenstein's um, session, which I, I'm really looking forward to. Tony was uh, unavoidably detained, which I'm sure he will tell um, comrades about. Um, so we've had to start this a week later. So thanks very much, uh, comrades, for uh, coming along. And I'd like to thank Chris uh, again for his contribution. This is, uh, this is being recorded, so you will be able to follow it up later. And there's also a reading list on our education site where you can follow up with some readings. So uh, thanks very much. And I'll, uh, I'll see everybody tomorrow. So good night, comrades, and thank you all.